AAA uh, staff from ANU, thank you for coming to support your colleagues, members of the Diplomatic Corps um, and friends in Canberra. Uh, we're here to have a presentation by Amy King and Amy Katalinak on Sino-Japanese relations, old enmities and new rivalries. Now since we'll have two speakers today, what we'll do is we'll have one speaker first and then followed by the second and then we'll conduct our Q&A at the end. So if you could please save your questions at the end, I'm sure they'll be dying to answer them by that stage. So just to kick off, I'll just introduce our speakers for today. Amy Katalinak speaking first. Yep. Yes, yep. so Amy C is kicking off. Dr. Amy Katalinak is a research fellow in the Department of International Relations at the Australian National University. She graduated with a PhD from the Department of Government at Harvard University in 2011, and her research focuses on Japan's role in the world. She's currently working on a book project that seeks to explain why conservative Japanese politicians paid so much attention to national security after 1997 and they did before, than they did before 1997. So without much further ado, I'll introduce Amy C. And obviously I forgot to introduce myself. I'm <laughs> Natalie Sanvi. I am the Vice President of the AAA ACT's branch. Um, and thank you all very much for coming. Um, good evening everyone. Thank you all very much for coming. I'm delighted to have been invited to speak about my research and hopefully uh, bring to you some ideas I have about future research that I hope I can get your feedback on uh, during the Q&A. So to begin today I want to take you to back to 1955. So in November of 1955, politicians affiliated with the Democratic Party joined forces with politicians affiliated with the Liberal Party to form the Liberal Democratic Party. They weren't so creative with the name there. <laughs> Uh, because the Liberal Democratic Party had a majority of seats in the House of Representatives, the lower house, they were able to select the Prime Minister and form the government. And they selected Hatoyama Ichiro as Prime Minister. Fast forward three years, 1958, the LDP faces its first election. Now at the time, Japan used a very odd electoral system, which I'm going to be talking about a lot today. Uh, under the system, if the LDP wanted to win a plurality of seats in the election, it had to run more than one candidate in each district. So what this means for LDP politicians is for every election from 1958 to 1993, LDP politicians were fighting elections against their co-partisans, against fellow LDP politicians. Now you might be thinking, well, so what? I came to hear a talk about national security policy. I don't care about elections. I don't really care about election campaigns. Well, you should care about election campaigns because uh, it matters a lot for national security. So I, I argue in my book, which is actually finished now and under review, so hopefully it will be forthcoming soon, that the fact that LDP politicians had to fight against co-partisans had enormous consequences for the amount of time that they could spend on national security, which in turn had consequences for Japan's national security policy and also for Japan's relationship with China. So in today's talk I want to try and accomplish two things. I want to first explain why to understand Japanese security policy and understand Japan's relationship with China, we've got to understand the constraints that LDP politicians were facing under Japan's old electoral system and the effect of the removal of those constraints by electoral reform in 1994. I'm then going to discuss how my findings in the book lead to new hypotheses for old questions that we might be interested in. For example, why are LDP politicians paying so much attention to national security now and they didn't pay much attention to national security before? Why are they paying attention to the security issues that they're paying attention to? For example, they're paying attention to history and they're not really paying attention to the nature of the Chinese military threat. And third, why isn't Japan a military superpower? Japan became an economic superpower but it never became a military one. You know, why not? This is a very old question that is really the reason I started studying this, uh, for better or worse, a really long time ago. Uh, and the, the last question is, why are relations with China so kind of bad? I don't want to say bad, but I'm not the person to characterise them as bad, but why are relations not so good right now with the PRC and they used to be, they used to be better? So I want to start today by describing the predicament that Japan's old electoral, old electoral system put LDP politicians in. So in parliamentary systems, we know that the party that wins the most seats forms the government. So in most, most political systems like Australia, New Zealand, other, almost all political systems in the world, almost all political systems in democracies, parties achieve this by selecting a popular party leader, coming up with a package of policies, and then promising to implement those policies after the election. And I've got a nice little picture here 
Um, I was just wondering if anyone knows what this picture is from. Um, it's a very sort of good looking young, young man. Uh, <laughs> So, so this is just an actor, actually. He's, he's not the Prime Minister of Japan, just that you might be a little bit surprised, but he, uh, he's a very famous Japanese actor called Kimutaku, and he played, uh, he played a Prime Minister in a drama called Change, Changi, uh, which came out about four years ago. But anyway, so parties in, in political system. I just thought it might be nicer to have him up there than, uh, than the actual Japanese Prime Minister. Um, so, so anyway, so parties, you know, they benefit. In most political systems, they can select a popular party leader and they can benefit from this. They can win elections. But the LDP was unable to do this. They were unable to win elections the way parties all over the world win elections because of the electoral system. So in a nutshell, Japan's electoral system was comprised of about 131 districts. And in every district, between three and five politicians were elected per, per district. So for the, for the LDP to win a majority of seats, it has to run more than one candidate in each district and also elect as many candidates as possible. So it needs to kind of figure out how many it's going to run and it needs to kind of maximise how many of those candidates that get, that get elected. Now you might think to yourself, well, you know, um, surely the LDP could, could choose a, pop, a popular party leader like Kimutaku, it would be not quite nice I think if he uh, became the Prime Minister. So they could get a popular leader and they could, you know, come up with some policies and they could sort of maybe poll their support in a district to decide, they could kind of see how many people supported the LDP in a district. And then they could say, okay, in this district we can run three candidates, and in a district, this district we can run two candidates. And then they could find a way to queue their party supporters to vote for particular politicians. They could say, okay, if you live in this area in the district, you can vote for, for this guy. And if you live in this part of the district, you can vote for this guy. So you might think this is, this is a possibility. So even though the LDP politicians are in this electoral system, maybe they can, they can do this. And we actually, they actually can't do this. And it's kind of, it's kind of important to understand why they, why they couldn't do this. And that's because Japanese voters had no incentives to follow cues from the party leader. So if, if voters listened to these cues and they were like, OK, LDP party leader, I will vote for this person uh, if, you, if you tell me to, they, they, if they follow those cues, then they're going to get public goods. So goods like, uh, goods like uh, welfare system, a uh, good education system, a better economy. But if they don't follow these party cues, they can actually get every single LDP politician in the district to work really hard for them, to provide them with pork. So I, I use pork, and when I talk about pork in the US, everybody knows what I mean. But when I talk about it in Australia, people are like, oh, we have such a clean political system. I don't really know what pork means. But really, it just means like grubby pork barrel politics, um, you know, building roads, bridges, community centres and things like that. So voters can get, they, they're not going to listen to what the party wants because they can get all of the politicians to work really hard for them. So what the LDP politicians did in 1958 was they decided to give, L what the leaders of the party did is they gave LDP politicians the resources to fight it out amongst themselves. So they created a playing field where LDP politicians could fight against each other. And they did this by giving LDP politicians vetoes in three policy areas of their choosing. So what this did is it enabled LDP politicians to specialise in different kinds of pork. So if there were three of us in a, a, an election district, I could be the construction person, Amy could be the agriculture, forestry and fisheries person, and Nat could be the commerce and industry person. So we can all kind of specialise in different kinds of pork, and that's in, that would enable us to compete against each other. So this is what LDP politicians did. Between elections, they filled budgets and legislation with pork for their constituents. And during elections, they said, look at all this pork I was able to provide for you. And so there are many consequences of this. And one of um, Canberra's finest residents, uh, uh, Aurelia George Mulgan, was one of the first people to kind of describe this as, as an un-Westminster system. So even though Japan is a parliamentary system, it's, it's, not a Westminster, it's supposed to be a Westminster system, but it's not because of the electoral system. Elections are not fought by party leaders. This is why we have polit the prime ministers in Japan are very fond of saying things like, "That's a really good idea. Um, I will, I will uh, consider your opinion, and we will take." All we will, sorry, <laughs> I'm just trying. So this is why party the prime ministers would fight elections by saying, um, "Yes, that's a very important opinion. We will discuss it thoroughly and take all opinions into account." So this is how elections were fought in Japan because they were not they were fought by individual LDP politicians uh, on their own. So it's better to conceive of the LDP as being comprised of like 300 different parties. So each politician is is their own party. 
And interestingly enough, another consequence of this system is that there were hardly any women candidates, because when electoral systems place a premium on pork, it means that it also pl they place a premium on individuals who can claim, who can credibly commit to long and uh, uninterrupted careers in politics, and it's harder for women to be able to commit to a long, uninterrupted uh, career in politics. So this is one of the reasons why we observe all you know, LDP politicians were basically men. Now, in my book, which is coming soon, um, I, um, I argue that it was very difficult for LDP politicians running under this system to pay attention to national security. And the reason is you can't use national security to generate benefits for one group of voters other and, uh, over another group of voters. It's much easier to use something like agriculture to generate you know, subsidies for farmers. You know, there are some people who are farmers and there are some people who are not farmers, so automatically that creates a benefit for one group over another. And it's impossible, right? National security, once it's provided, you can't limit its consumption to one group of voters or another. So LDP politicians faced uh, very strong incentives to pretend to be very uninterested in national security. And you might say, well, all sh sure, this is all fine, but Japan is a pretty powerful country and maybe politicians were able to pay attention to national security in secret. So maybe they were able to pretend they were really interested in pork all the time, but they actually were able to pay attention to national security in secret. And we actually, we, it's actually very difficult for LDP politicians to pay attention to national security, even in secret. And that's because these vetoes work the other way too. So in order to actually influence security policy, you have to, you have to nominate security as one of those three areas that you're going to have the veto in. And politicians have no incentives to give up. You know, when they can have a veto in agriculture, they're not going to acquire a veto in national security. So it means that it's very difficult for LDP politicians to pay any attention to, to national security. And the consequences are that conservative LDP politicians, sorry, I use conservative and LDP interchangeably, they paid very little attention to security issues, and they even paid very little attention to security threats. So these, this is a picture of uh, Japanese people who were abducted by North Korea in the, in the early 1980s, being repatriated to Japan um, in 2003, 2004, I think. And this is the North Korean issue of the abductions is, is kind of an interesting one because LDP, like, it was a security threat. North Koreans were abducting Japanese citizens. LDP politicians were told about this so many times and they completely ignored it. So they really paid attention, little attention to uh, security threats. And when they were really pressured by the US and they really had to do something, they, they threw some money at the problem. You know, they opened their checkbook, they set up an ODA budget, they decided to pay host nation support. But moving on. After, okay, so in 1994, beginning of 1994, Japan reformed its electoral system. And this happened because a group of LDP politicians defected from the LDP in 1993. Uh, paving the way for a new coalition government. Seven parties made up this coalition. They came into power, they reformed the electoral system precisely to enable L politicians to compete in elections as part of a party, to kind of to get rid of this intra-party competition that I've been discussing. So that was one of, one of their goals. The new system is comprised of 300 single member districts and 100 seat, 180 seats uh, elected according to proportional representation, or PR. <laughs> The most important feature of Japan's uh, electoral system is that parties have to win as many single member districts as possible. So for LDP politicians this was kind of a big shock because now they have to actually win, they actually have to place first in the district whereas under the old system they could be fifth and still win a seat. So they could be kind of unpopular under the old system and they could still get in but now they have to be really popular, they have to place first. And you might think, okay, well, even if they have to place first, can't they still, can't they just rely on pork for 51% of the voters? So if they're using pork before, they can just continue to use pork, but now they can kind of widen the range of people that they, that they provide pork for. And the answer is no, we actually shouldn't observe this under the new electoral system. And that's because it's much a better strategy a better strategy is available, and that's to team up with LDP politicians in the other 299 single member districts, come up with positions on policy issues like national security that affect people in all of those 300 districts, national level policy issues, and promise to implement those after, after the election. So this is the strategy that most parties use. This suddenly became available for LDP politicians. So I, I sort of argue in the book 
that we should expect LDP politicians to have shifted their electoral strategies from pork for the district to policy issues like national security. I'm not going to talk about this a lot here, um, but in the book I, I collected 7,497 candidate election manifestos. They look like this. This is Abe Shinzo's manifesto from the 2009 election. Um, he's talking, talking about foreign policy right here, Shicho Suru Gaiko. Uh, this, this is kind of just an, an example of what the manifestos look like. Um, and I just have a very simple graph here showing you I used a, a new method of quantitative text analysis to analyse the content of the manifestos. And I, I provide, this is the subject of two whole chapters in my book, so, no, no, don't take a picture of that one. <laughs> it's a better one. Sorry. Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so I show that um, I'm happy to... This is a really long, this basically this took like three or four years of my life, so I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A. Um, but it shows that LDP politicians used to adopt electoral strategies of basically two-thirds pork, and now they're adopting electoral strategies of two-thirds policy. And this is the graph about national security policy. So this shows you that in these three elections under the old electoral system, they ignored national security, which is what I expected to, to find. And then after 1993, first election is 1996, they start paying attention to it. They ignored issues like the Gulf War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, things like that. So, second part of my talk. I, I, so the findings in my book offer new hypotheses for questions that, that, that are of interest to scholars of Japanese security policy. So the first question that I raised at the very beginning is why do we observe so much attention to security issues at the moment among LDP politicians? So Japan Watch is a very kind of interest, like we're kind of like why all this focus on security now given that LDP politicians ignored it for such a long time? And the answer that I offer in my book is that because their electoral strategies have shifted from pork to policy which enables them to pay attention to national security. So it's, it's being driven by this shift in electoral strategy. It's not being driven, I want to be really clear here, it's not being driven, so conservative politicians are not paying more attention to national security because they're worried about China. They're also not paying attention to national security because they're worried about North Korea and they're worried about, the, about US abandonment. And I'm happy to talk about how I make this argument in, in, in the Q&A. They're also not paying attention to national security because they've shifted to the right. They haven't shifted to the right. I use a, a model to examine their election manifestos and to estimate the ideological positions in the manifestos. And I show very clearly that they've actually moved to the centre until 2005. 2009, there's a tiny shift to the right and I don't have data after 2009. But this actually makes sense because when you're in a single member district, you have to come to the centre of the, you have to be in the ideological centre in order to maximise your vote share. They also haven't switched to national security because they're responding to new voter concerns or new voter preferences. Nor are they just trying to use national security to distract voters from their economic woes because of the economic recession. This is also not, not what's going on. And finally, they're not, actually there's a lot of other not, not, not I have in my book, but um, they're not, they're not, they haven't shifted to national security because they're responding to the retirement of LDP politicians with war memories either. So one of the takeaways is that LDP politicians would be paying attention to national security even if China was not rising. So the rise of China, it provides material for them to use, but if China wasn't rising, they would just be using other material. This is a, a big takeaway of, of this project. And I was just sort of realising yesterday that we can observe this, like even wannabe politicians have changed their behaviour. So in the past, if you wanted to be a politician in the diet, you would become a local politician and you would try to create a reputation for being really good at providing pork. But what do we observe local politicians doing now? We observe them taking stances on national security issues. Like for example, Ishihara Shintaro with his, I'm going to purchase the Senkaku Islands, governor of Tokyo. Um, he, he started talking about this, same with Hashimoto Toru. We observe a lot of like, politicians who are not in the diet readying themselves for a political career in the diet by developing, taking stances on national security issues. Second question, why are they focusing on these security issues and not other security issues? 
So one of the what, observers of Japanese Japanese politics have observed that there's actually a little, even though politicians are paying more attention to national security, they're not focusing on the security threats or how Japan should meet those security threats. It's kind of weird. Like for example, in North Korea policy, they're prioritizing the abductions, resolution of the abduction issue over resolution of the nuclear and ballistic missile issue. I'm not saying they're all doing that all of the time, but there have been some examples in Japan's uh, behavior in the six party talks where it's clearly prioritized resolution of the abductions. And in, in China policy, they're focusing on Japan's role and responsibility in the Second World War, and they're not focusing on the nature of the Chinese security threat and what Japan should be doing about this. There's even some evidence by my colleague uh, at the ANU, Yongwook Yu, that their focus on these issues is having a perverse effect of exacerbating the security threats posed by China. So why do we observe Japan shooting itself in the foot with these issues? So my tentative hypothesis is that, well, politicians are trying to get elected, they're, they're trying to get elected, they're not trying to secure Japan. So they might also be trying to secure Japan, but what comes first is getting elected. And for some reason, these issues are more attractive than, than, than issues related to the actual nature of the security threat. So why isn't Japan a military superpower? This is a question that lots of people have tried to answer. I've, I could give you like 10 different answers and I'm, I'm just going to be the 11th person. Um, so Professor Dick Samuels says that um, LDP politicians, after Japan became an economic superpower, they just decided to, uh, they calculated that they would continue to rely on the US because it was easier and cheaper and the US would come to Japan's defense. Professor Thomas Berger says, well, LDP politicians didn't become a military superpower because they were identifying with an anti-militarist culture. Catalinac, unpublished, <laughs> will be coming soon, says, uh, LDP politicians didn't become a, super, a military superpower because they weren't paying attention to national security. No one was even really thinking about whether Japan should become a military superpower or not at the time. No one was thinking about it. And I want to emphasize, this is not their fault. I should correct myself. They might be thinking about it, but they are unable to do anything about it. They're unable to change security policy to become a military superpower. Even if they wanted to pay attention to this issue, they weren't able to because these institutions were boxing them in and preventing them from, from paying attention. And this also explains, I just have here, why one of the architects of Japan's grand strategy of relying on the US, Yoshida Shigeru, the Prime Minister in the 1950s, he's very rueful about why the security strategy that Japan adopted in the 1950s just stays and why Japan isn't as, as active in the world and in, secure, in the security realm. Third question, or maybe this is the final question. Um, why are relations with China bad in recent years and they used to be good? So I'm not putting a, I'm not deciding that they're bad, I'm just, we're, we're kind of interested. Why is all this friction arising between the two, the two countries? For many years, Japan is said to have actually accommodated the rise of China. This is an argument made by my colleague, uh, Linus Hagstrom, and, and his graduate student in, in Sweden. And they present a lot of evidence uh, in support of this accommodation. And, and I say, well, accommodating the rise of China is kind of the same as not doing anything. They may have cared about China, and they may have wanted to do something to, to respond to, say, China's acquisition of a nuclear weapon or something, but their hands were tied. I think it doesn't make sense, so my point here is it doesn't really make sense to think of LDP politicians as rational, rationally weighing up uh, the strategic situation in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and kind of thinking, you know, what should Japan do about the China, about, you know, China rising, or what should Japan do? Basically, we should conceive of these politicians as being really anxious to get back to their constituents and build more roads. Recently, unresolved issues have emerged on the agenda. And I'm like, so, okay, so Japan is no longer accommodating China. Some people say Japan is now kind of it's kind of trying to balance, not, maybe not balance, but is a little bit feistier than it was in the past. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Why are there unresolved issues? And so uh, this is something that no one, no one really talks about. But Japan was way more powerful than China for a really long time. It could have forced China. You know, IR theorists and neorealists would say, why didn't Japan just force China to accept Japanese sovereignty of the Senkaku Islands, for example. 
So why did Japan agree to shelve these issues that might come back and, and bite, oh, I won't finish, yeah, come back and kind of attack them a little bit later? So why didn't Japan force China to accept its demands? Unresolved issues, I think, have emerged because LDP politicians, they have to discuss national security issues now. So they're just picking security issues to discuss. And I, I don't have a theory about why they're picking these issues rather than those issues, but this is sub something I want to study in, in future research, and I'm keen to get your, um, your, thoughts, your thoughts on this. Uh, I'm going to conclude there. Thank you very much. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Amy. Uh, we'll now introduce Dr. Amy King. She's a lecturer in the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the Australian National University. She received her doctorate in international relations from the University of Oxford, where she was an Australian Rhodes Scholar. Her research focuses on Sino-Japanese relations, the economic security nexus, and the legacy of war, imperialism, and late industrialisation in Asia. Amy also holds a Bachelor of Arts, First Class Honours in International Studies, a Bachelor of International Business from the University of South Australia, and an MPhil in Modern Chinese Studies from the University of Oxford. And she'll be talking on the Chinese side of today's presentation. Um, and just before I ask Amy to come up here, I just wanted to say, if you are interested in live tweeting part of this event, um, where the speakers are comfortable taking photos and, and actually just allowing some of that information to kind of reach other audiences, please go ahead. Our Twitter handle is at AAA on ACT. Is that right, Will? And um, both Dr. Amy Katalanak and Amy King also have Twitter accounts as well. So we'll be trying to get that out more often in future, um, either via Facebook or Twitter. So if you're wondering what I'm doing, type it at the front. I'm not being rude. I'm actually just reaching a different <laughs> audience. So anyway, thank you, Dr. Amy King. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to AAA for, for hosting both of us tonight um, and to my colleague Amy for a terrific first presentation. Um, it's been terrific. We both joined the ANU uh, around the same time uh, last year, so it's been wonderful to have a, a colleague, fellow colleague who works on Northeast Asia to bounce a lot of these ideas uh, off of. So I'm going to turn my attention more to the Chinese side of, uh, of this particular story. Um, and I want to speak tonight about a slightly different period in time. I'm also going to be taking us back to the 1950s and 60s, but we'll be spending a little bit more of, more of my time uh, in that particular uh, uh, few decades. So when we think about the China-Japan relationship, we encounter one of two dominant narratives. The first dominant narrative is this one. It's a profoundly hostile, tense, competitive relationship <coughs> in which protests like this uh, frequently spill over in China. We hear frequent condemnations from Beijing about Japanese wartime history, its inability to properly atone for the past. Uh, and all of this is, un is, is, is apparently unhelped um, by right-wing Japanese politicians or by an education system in China that emphasises very strong anti-Japanese sentiment. Uh, so we think of this relationship as a profoundly troubled one. But there's a second narrative about the Japan-China relationship which really emphasises the major economic ties between the two countries. It's an economic relationship that's said to have taken off in the late 1970s. For some reason all the numbers there have disappeared on my graph, so I apologise for that. Uh, but this is a picture of uh, Japanese FDI to China, foreign direct investment to China uh, since the 1980s um, and has peaked to, uh, that should be around 90% uh, at the top there. Um, today the bilateral Japan-China trade relationship is the third largest trade relationship in the world uh, and even more important is Japanese investment in China, Japanese manufacturing uh, investment, use of technology transfers to China uh, and the, the role that Japan plays um, in uh, distributing goods, technology to China, machinery etc. that Japan then uh, China then manufactures and exports to the world. So we have these two narratives that, in some ways, don't sit easily together. A very tense, hostile political and security relationship, and yet at the same time, an incredibly important economic relationship. What I want to do tonight is to talk about my research, which I hope tries to bring together these two uh, narratives, if you like, and suggest that they aren't actually in contradiction, but in fact born out of the same uh, Chinese set of I Chinese ideas about Japan. My research focuses on a period of the relationship that's often overlo overlooked. Uh, I look at the two to three decades after the Second World War, in the early Cold War, 
uh, a time when the two countries were assumed to be in absolutely no contact because of the Cold War strategic order. Communist China was aligned to the Soviet Union, Japan was aligned to the United States. They, they did not enjoy a diplomatic relationship, official contact was prohibited, uh, and Japan was part of the US-led embar economic embargo uh, on China, which prohibited the majority of trade. So most scholars assume that the two countries were completely close to each other during this period, that, that very little happened. But somehow, in 1964, well before diplomatic normalization took place in the 70s, Japan became China's most important trade partner. And just a few years after that, in 1971, Japan was China's most important source of technology, of industrial goods, of machinery, uh, and of industrial and technological expertise. This was something that was noted at the time by the CIA in the United States, who was investing a great deal of energy in uh, investigating uh, Japanese policies towards the region uh, and trying to understand what was going on between these two countries, and, and obviously a great, a great deal of concern. Relations had not yet normalized between the US and China. So I was very intrigued, I guess, by this, this situation. These two countries who are ostensibly still wartime enemies, uh, countries that we know have still not gotten over, apparently, the, the legacy of the Second World War, countries that are situated on opposite sides of a Cold War divide, and yet this economic relationship is emerging. I want to talk about how and why this relationship emerged in the 50s and 60s and what that means for our understanding of the contemporary China-Japan relationship. To undertake my research, um, I was able to, very fortunately able to make use of a whole uh, host of um, new Chinese archives that's, that started to be declassified in the last five or ten years. Uh, in particular, the Chinese Foreign Ministry archive, the Waijabu Dangang one, which uh, under a set of Chinese laws in the early 2000s set about periodically declassifying uh, the key foreign policy documents uh, from the 50s and 60s. Unfortunately, last year they shut down their shop again and have more or less refused access um, to about 90% of the holdings. So I was very fortunate to get in in about a three or four year period uh, when those archives were, were freely available. Hopefully they will reopen again. My research also draws on um, a host of British, US, uh, Japanese archival sources, things such as the People's Daily editorials and speeches and biographies by, by key Chinese leaders. So the argument that I make in uh, a book that I'm also currently uh, drafting uh, is that in the wake of the Second World War, Chinese policymakers worked incredibly hard to build economic ties with Japan because they saw Japan as a symbol of a modern industrial nation state and an important source of industrial goods and expertise. They did things throughout the 50s and 60s like this. Uh, this is the signing of the Liao Takasaki Trade Ag Agreement in 1962, an unofficial trade agreement. The two countries were not allowed to have an official bilateral agreement. Uh, and it was signed by a negotiator on either of the two sides, Liao Changzhe and Takasaki Tatsunosuke in Japan. And throughout the early 1950s, starting as early as 1951, Chinese leaders worked very, very hard to try and expand their trade with Japan. Like China, Japan was a fellow late industrialiser. Japanese officials understood the importance of rapid industrialisation for a country trying to develop and become a strong nation state that could stand up to the Western powers. Japanese also understood the importance of using technology to achieve catch-up growth and to develop a strong military force. Japan had also, like China, been an ag a, a primarily agrarian-based economy, and so it understood the difficulty of trying to maintain balanced economic development between the agricultural and the industrial spheres of the economy. And so, not always successfully, of course, when we look at failures like the Great Leap Forward, Chinese officials were talking to Japanese officials throughout the 50s and 60s for advice and for expertise on how to undertake rapid industrialization, on how to achieve balanced economic development. So we see examples like uh, in the former Manchuria, northeast China, Dongbei. A large number of Japanese technicians and scientists were left behind in Dongbei at the end of the Second World War. The majority of Japanese of the Japanese Empire was repatriated back to Japan in the late 40s, but there are around uh, two or three thousand. Um, sorry, there are around twenty or thirty thousand. Sorry, Japanese among whom about. 
7,000 Japanese technicians who were still living in northeast China uh, in the early 50s. And the Chinese officials were extremely um, excited about the possibility of using their expertise. In places such as this, um, major industrial um, sites, steel and coal works uh, in northeast China that had been first established by the Japanese uh, <coughs> imperial forces in the northeast. And so they used Japanese engineering skills to try and develop new techniques of mining, uh, to try and um, improve the efficiency of their um, industrial output, output uh, to develop new techniques uh, and new scientific techniques. They also frequently, throughout the 50s and 60s, uh, engaged in, um, and I track the nu huge numbers of meetings that took place between the two sides, uh, to try and obtain industrial goods from Japan. Now this wasn't easy. Uh, the US-led embargo prohibited Japan from exporting industrial goods to, to China. Japan was very eager to try and in, enhance its trade with China. Uh, Japanese across the political spectrum saw trade with China as an important development. Those on the left uh, believed that they had uh, an obligation to atone for Japan's wartime past and help China's development. Those on the right, and particularly those from business groups, were very uh, interested in, in trying to rebuild this Chinese-Japanese trade so that Japan could access cheap raw materials uh, and those kinds of goods that Japan had really depended on uh, when it was an imperial power in China and Korea. But the Chinese were frequently uh, thwarted in their efforts. So the, actual the size of the actual trade relationship throughout the 50s and 60s remained very small. Uh, and much, much smaller than the size of the China's trade with the Soviet Union or Japan's trade with the US and Southeast Asia. Nevertheless, despite this, the modest size of the trade relationship, uh, that doesn't, I think, doesn't tell us much about the extreme efforts Chinese officials went to to try and uh, obtain goods and expertise from Japan. Officials such as Lei Renmin, who was the Minister of Foreign Trade, uh, Nan Han Chen, who was the Governor of the People's Bank of China, Zhou Enlai, the Foreign Minister and Premier, were incredibly important in driving this relationship. It was, from the, from the Chinese perspective, a government-led uh, attempt to build a relationship. It was called people's diplomacy, but it was very much driven from the top in China. On the Japanese side, it was typically uh, Diet members, um, non-major uh, non coalitions uh, from within the LDP and other political parties. Uh, and then lots of left-wing groups, members of the Japanese Socialist Party, Japan Communist Party, etc. Another set of key Japanese actors in, in this story are actually the heads of major um, steelworks, major conglomerates in Japan after the war, who had been important actors in Manchuria. Uh, many of them, such as Uda Koichi, had been uh, key members of the South Manchurian Railway Company uh, in China during the 20s, 30s and 40s, and who subsequently, many of them were purged, but then after the purging uh, in the second uh, post-Second World War period in Japan, became important heads of major Japanese industries. And these people understood China. They understood uh, Chinese industry, the importance of the Japan-China economic uh, network, um, and they had contacts and expertise and an understanding of China that they were able to draw on. And so we see hundreds and hundreds of these kinds of meetings between Chinese and Japanese uh, throughout the 50s and 60s that really stands in stark contrast to the image we have of these two countries being absolutely close to one another during this period. However, this is only part of the story. Uh, and throughout the 50s and 60s, Chinese officials did see Japan as an important industrial partner, uh, a source of industrial goods and expertise. But Japan's industrial prowess, Japan's technological skills, also meant that Chinese officials remained deeply concerned that Japan's industrial and technological edge made Japan a latent threat to China. So when we look at, Jap at Chinese writings about Japan, Chinese discussions about the post-war order uh, from this period, and foreign ministry documents are very important for this, what we see is constant discussion about Japan's comprehensive strength. Uh, the kinds of the kinds of terms that we hear about China talking about today, comprehensive national power. That Japan's uh, industrial capabilities meant that it was able to, to revive and quickly rehabilitate the kinds of strategic industries that had been so important to, China before, uh, to, to Japan before the war and that had made Japan such a threat to countries such as China 
Although Japan had obviously be, become a very different uh, political system and economic system in the post-war period, in part because of the US occupation and in part because of its own domestic reforms, Chinese officials uh, weren't particularly reassured by this. Uh, they very much saw uh, J China, uh, Japan's uh, power in industrial terms. They didn't care about the, the limitation on, on war in the 1947 uh, constitution. What they were really concerned about was that Japan retained this technological and industrial edge. And when we look at Chinese discussions about Japan's latent capabilities, its latent threat, we get a strong sense of how China thought about war in the post-Second World War era. It very much talked about war as being, uh, modern war as being industrial war. Uh, that Germany and Japan had shown how they, they, how they could use industrial capabilities, technological capabilities, how they could harness science and technology to become major threats uh, to world security. And I think when we think about China during the 1950s and 60s, we, we often think about China's articulation of ideas such as peaceful coexistence, ideas that are put forward um, at the Bandung meeting and other, and other key meetings with, with the leaders of India and other countries, where it was arguing for a new world order that was based on equality uh, between all countries, regardless of whether they were weak or strong. But underneath this, and if we, we sort of drill down into Chinese ideas about Japan, we get a uh, I think a very good sense of a, of a deeper paranoia that was shaping Chinese security and foreign policy thinking around this time. And this was the view that unless countries became industrialized countries, unless they developed technological skills, they simply wouldn't be treated as equal modern states. And I think this helps to explain China's drive for rapid industrialization and the great failures of that uh, during the Mao era in particular um, to become a strong nation state. We also see very interesting developments such as uh, in 1961 and 62 when Mao Zedong directs key military leaders in China such as Nye Rongjian who was the father of China's nuclear program to look at how Japan has managed to integrate its finance and military, its economic and military developments um, and the way in which it, it has understood the links between industry and military. Uh, and so this is just one of the examples of uh, Chinese leaders looking to, to how Japan has managed that post-war development. So I guess the overarching takeaway from this, this period is that Chinese fears of the Japanese threat didn't stem from a view that they saw Japan as being inherently evil or militaristic, uh, as I think a lot of us think about today, and a lot of the, I think, contemporary Chinese discourse suggests. In fact, they derive from China's ideas about the industrial and technological basis of modern warfare. They looked quite objectively at Japan and said that Japan remains quite a strong country. It has been able to undertake rapid economic and industrial re rebuilding in the 50s and 60s and therefore remains a threat to China. So why does this period and these, the, these Chinese ideas about Japan matter for our understanding of the contemporary China-Japan relationship? I think it suggests that the two narratives that I talked about at the beginning, this idea of a tense, hostile, political and security relationship on the one hand, and yet booming economic ties on the other, are actually not all that compatible, uh, and are not as incompatible, sorry, as we, as we might first think. In fact, they have their roots in these Chinese ideas about Japan as both an important economic partner, an industrial model, a development model, but also as a latent threat because of those industrial and technological capabilities. And I think when we look at contemporary Chinese attitudes towards Japan today, we see a deep sense of unease that China still remains weak uh, relative to Japan. Of course, China today is far more economically and industrially developed than the Japan that was defeated by, uh, than the China that was defeated by Japan uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries. But China remains dependent on Japanese advanced technology, industrial machinery, um, and all sorts of uh, technological and industrial goods for its own economic development. And I think despite a lot of um, maybe overblown talk that we see coming out of um, semi-official PLA types, uh, it is quite likely that if push came to shove in a military conflict, that J Japan would still retain the edge. And a Japan certainly aligned to the United States would, would absolutely retain the edge in a war with China. So China has acquired many of the trappings of a modern industrial power, but its leaders remain plagued by a, a huge number of challenges that you would all know of, domestic and international. Pollution, declining economic growth rates, corruption, potential social unrest, 
sovereignty disputes, uh, untested military power. And each of these issues threaten the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party and their search for a more central, powerful place for China in the world. So I think for Chinese leaders, although they can look back at, with pride at the industrial power and, and economic development that China has, uh, has acquired, uh, they continue to feel inferior and that they are picked on or bullied by the world around them. Similarly, of course, Japan's leaders' own failures to perhaps adequately address their country's militaristic history is a continuous slight to the CCP uh, and to the, the Chinese public that, that China has not yet succeeded in standing up to foreign imperialists like Japan. So what does this mean for the future of the China-Japan relationship? I think contemporary Chinese attitudes and policies towards Japan are, re are rooted in China's sense of, of weakness. I think Chinese officials will obviously continue to strengthen and modernise their economic and military capabilities until they believe they have caught up with powers such as Japan. Yet the dilemma for China is, of course, that it continues to be dependent on Japanese technology and industrial cap capital for its own economic development. Today, we can look at Xi Jinping and Abe Shinzo, who are both trying to implement bold economic reform plans for their countries. And though it's not said by these two leaders, those economic reform plans are very, very dependent on a healthy economic relationship between the two countries. So Japan will continue to serve as an important partner for China's economic development efforts. But I think at the same time, Japan will continue to serve as the threat that propels China's military modernization. I suspect we won't see much great improvement in the bilateral China-Japan relationship as a result. Thank you.